Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and salvation. Amen. I was thinking this morning as uh, I reread our text from Genesis that for 38 years I've known and loved this passage, this story, but I've never really tried to preach on it. Um, it's very interesting, and it has some very honest uh, twists. The humanity of the characters just shine through. So I thought that maybe I would do that. And as I moved into it more and more, I saw the relevance of the text for life today. You see, we have these two characters, uh, Abraham, who's the patriarch of the whole Jewish race, and his wife, Sarah, and they had wanted children for a long time, but had been unable to conceive. Sarah was so distraught that at one point she pushed her husband, Abraham, to sleep with their maidservant, Hagar. They had a son, Ishmael, but that's a whole different story. Because one day, two people show up at their tent, two visitors that we are told are heavenly representatives, and they say to Sarah something that she can't believe. You see, she's around 90 years old, and these two people show up and say, guess what, Sarah? You're, you're pregnant. Now, on the one hand, we ex would expect Sarah to be incredibly overwrought with joy and just ecstatic, and maybe the best reaction would be so stunned that uh, she would faint. But that's not what she does. What Sarah does when they tell her that she will have a child, given her age, she looks at them in a stunned fashion, I imagine, and starts to laugh. She starts to laugh, and she probably said to them, <laughs> you're kidding, right? No way. But they weren't. And she was. And nine months later, Isaac, the second in that whole lineage, is born, and God's promise to Abraham of fathering an entire nation takes its next step forward. When I read this, I was thinking about when Jean and I had our third child, Kelly, you know, at least I was thinking, uh, this is going to be a breeze. Been there, done that. You know, we had to, we moved through this, we matured. What we didn't realize, or at least I didn't realize, is I didn't expect that uh, Kelly would not fit the mold, and she was colicky for months. She cried incessantly when we would try to lay her down at night to sleep, so Jean and I decided for our own sanity that we would alternate nights. I'd stay up one, she'd stay up the next. Um, you know, you get to the point where you'd sell your soul to have two consecutive nights of sleep. And I distinctly remember thinking, I'm 36 years old. I'm too old for this stuff. <laughs> so you see, on the one hand, I understand in a much younger age than Sarah's portrayed, I understand her reaction of laughter that you've got to be kidding, no way. But on the other hand, what I hear or read into the story is a tone or a tinge of doubt. Doubt in the improbable and unimaginable power of God. We love the text that says, with God all things are possible. But then why is it so hard for us to accept, to live by, to act upon and believe in? to believe in even the slightest possibility that what God has said, God, what God says will come to pass, will happen. Choosing instead to bring God down to our level, our expectations, our world and its boundaries, our human concepts and wisdom, rather than letting God be God. So as I read this, it... it came to me, I realized Sarah is really, actually I should flip that, we are no different than Sarah because we laugh too. We hear these scriptures and stories, Christmas, Easter, and other times we say, no way, impossible, 
It's just a story, metaphor. You're dreaming. <laughs> you know, just think of the scriptures. Turn the other cheek. <laughs> There's a good one, right? Love my enemy. <laughs> what are you smoking? Give away all that I've worked for and saved my entire life. Now you're talking crazy. But Jesus wasn't kidding and God wasn't joking. So why is it we disbelieve to the point that we scoff and laugh? Why do we limit the dreams of God or bring them down to the size of our own nightmares? As a young pastor, I was blessed to have a, a veteran pastor that I could dump on when things were, you know, when I was kind of down and things weren't quite right. And I'd say, Dad, you know, I just don't get it. I, I'm trying my best. I'm working my hardest. And I just don't feel like I'm making any progress, making a difference. You know, first I get excuses and then there seems to be negativity. And suddenly I hear, well, you know, he's a great preacher, but that's just, that's just talk. That's just a young man's idealistic joke. And he would always respond, well, Keith, be patient. Be patient because God has all the time in the world. To which I replied, but, you know, <laughs> Dad, I don't. I don't. And he'd say, well, that's because you're not God. Accept it. Time is a foreign concept when you're eternal. Time is a limitation of humanity, not of divinity. A thousand years is but a twinkle in God's eyes. Believe that. And then step by step, stone by stone, things will happen. God won't do it for us, but God will work with us. You know, we, have, we need to have some skin in the game as well. But by God's hands, not by our labors, but by taking God's hands, we are able to bridge the gap that separates the realities of today from the possibilities of tomorrow. It's an interesting story in Exodus following, you know, the whole, the whole Egyptian slave and free and Moses thing that after wandering for 40 years in the desert, the Hebrew people finally are standing on the edge of the promised land. And between them and Jericho, between them and the land God promises them is the Jordan River. And of course, having heard the tales of God separating the waters of the Red Sea that they could escape from Egypt, they asked God to do the same thing. And God said, huh, -uh, not doing it. This time, we have to work together. You should be more mature by now. And God tells them that nothing will happen until the first person, first person in faith puts their toes into the Jordan River. And when that happened, when someone was willing to take the step into the waters, the waters parted. The waters opened and they entered into a new place, a new home, what they called a promised land. You know, upon numerous occasions, I've had people say to me, you know, great sermon, Keith, but you know that's never going to happen. Are you talking crazy? You know, black and white people, men and women, they're different. You know, think there's always going to be issues and problems. You know, nations aren't going to stop fighting. It's just human nature. It's the way we are. The world will never be one. Yeah, it's a great idea. It sounds wonderful, but uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not thinking it's going to happen. Then in my mind, the tape plays of, and I'm dating myself when I say that, I recall Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream message. And today, just as when I first heard it, I still get inspirational chills up and down my spine because that's the way 
life should be. What he said is the way we should act, how our world should be, how God wants it to be. So why is it we taint or diminish, some even despise, laugh and joke about those words, that dream, when really I think we should be standing up and shouting, count me in. After all, Kant never did anything, and it's the start that stops most people. Having been a part of athletics and sports teams most of my life, I, I know very, very much per, firsthand that any respectable player or team enters the competition convinced that they will win. Why play if, if you don't think you can? Now, they may win, they may not, there's no guarantee, but they believe they can, and to that they give their best. You know, we, we love to say no pain, no gain. If it's worth having, it's worth working for. We say those things, and they should be in tandem with God, all things are possible. Because if we don't believe in those things, if we don't believe in the impossible that's a part of our faith that we have preached for generations, then the entire biblical narrative becomes laughable. Paul says we would be the most saddest of all people. So why do it? There are already enough cynics and doubters among us, why add or contribute to their cause or their numbers? You know, when I watch my grandchildren play, I marvel at their imagination and remember my childhood imagination. You know, as a child, it doesn't matter if the story you're portraying with the toys is factual or realistic or not. You know, you don't need gas for your Tonka truck and, you know, any character can fly if you want them to. It doesn't have to make sense because it's their imagination at work. It's their story that they're trying to make come to pass. And if I'm playing with them and I do something contrary to that, they will look at me and say, Papa, you can go away. Get with it or go away. We'll just get Grandma. We'll get Nini to help. Makes me wonder and ask, well, when did we lose our imagination? What happened to our imagination? When did we stop dreaming? When was it we decided that going back is better than moving forward because we're afraid of what we don't know? And we say that, and yet we can contradict ourselves, and we love it when leaders say to us, our best days are yet ahead. Well, if the best days are yet ahead, why do we cling to the ones behind us? When someone, as a child, when I, I would remember when someone would say to my father, um, a man who lived through the Depression, two world wars, Korea, Vietnam, the riots in Watts, and a host of other things, he would always say, you know, the good old days weren't all that good. Those words are mirrored in a song of my generation by Billy Joel when he said, you know, the old days weren't always that good and tomorrow isn't as bad as it may seem. Truth is, we could eliminate poverty. We could achieve peace. Statistically speaking, the true facts are we've come a long way and we're closer to those things than we have ever been in humanity's history. You see, we could do that. It is possible to think uh, to leave thinking that is tied to the past and the way things were in the past in the past. But we all know you can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. It's clear. It's clear. So why do we obfuscate and create a smokescreen around the truth by saying, oh, can't be done. Let's just stick with what's working. But the problem is it isn't. In the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul writes, Letting go of what holds me back and reaching for what lies ahead, I strive for my upward call in Christ Jesus. And Ecclesiastes reads, there's a time for everything, 
a time for joy and a time for sorrow, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to wage war and a time to wage peace. Friends, this is our time to wage peace. Peace between those who are up and those who are down, those who are left and those who are right, those who are black or brown or white, those who are in, those who are pushed out. To do this, not for personal gain, but for the health and wholeness and well-being of God's world. So that we rebirth our nation and hopefully the world. A nation that espoused to this dream of equality and fairness and justice for all, but has yet to fully achieve it. A world that by now has to acknowledge with all we've been through and tried that there is no other way. And then, if we did that, I think maybe, like Sarah, we too could laugh. In fact, we would not just laugh. It's possible we would have the last laugh. The last laugh on the doubters, the cynics, and the haters of our age. And I believe then, when that happens, that if we pause long enough to listen, we just might even hear God chuckling, saying to God's self, I knew they could do it. It's time. Game on. Amen.